that. So thank you for that, Ronnie. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Albert Hakim. I'm a certified merger and acquisitions advisor with the Kensington oh. Company. And what we do uh, simply said, we're, we're business brokers. We help put sellers of businesses and buyers of businesses together. Uh, but in reality, we're much, much more than that. Uh, we, 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 in order to uh, complete a successful transaction, and Stu will echo this, uh, we've got to really understand that business, its positives, it, its negatives, its growth, its financial history, its place in the world, and we've got to understand our buyers. What are their needs? What are they really looking for? Is it a good match? Is it a good fit? So, uh, I, I, you know, in a cheeky way, I say that we're business matchmakers. That's what we do, and we try to get these transactions to the finish line. So, please know that in addition to what I do here, I've been a business owner for nearly thirty years, and. Between Stu and I in the merger and acquisitions world, we probably have about 30 years combined doing this. And Ronnie, the number one question, without a doubt, is what is my business worth? Which is why I think you, you have a lot of participation this morning. So we're going to tell you, but we're going to tell you not everything you want to hear. This is a huge subject. It's a huge, complex subject that you, there's no way you can cover in one workshop because the truth is, much like no two people are the same, no two businesses are the same. You can have the same exact business with the same exact financial performance, and one will be worth so much more than the other for many intangible reasons. The role of the owner, how they keep their financials, how they run things. You know, they have one big customer versus 300 small customers to make the same revenue. All of these things play a part in what the business is worth. But ultimately, the simple answer is your business is worth what someone is going to pay for it. That's, that's the bottom line. That's the truth. So, okay. That being said, let me I did prepare a bunch of slides. I don't know that we're going to get to all of them because they're not all going to be relevant to uh, those of us on this uh, presentation. So, um, you know, we can work through them. We can not get to them. I will happily, um, give me one second. That wasn't successful, right? You haven't seen my screen yet. There we go. All right, can, can everyone see my screen? Yes, I see heads nodding. All right, so I'm going to ask uh, Leslie and Ronnie to kind of be uh, moderators here, just monitor the chat room. If there's a question, absolutely interrupt me. And uh, I don't see the, the, the other folks. If someone raises their hand, let's, let's take my question. So that good looking young man in the picture used to be me. And I, I call this really the pandemic edition uh, about valuation and exit because you, 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 you cannot understand valuation and what goes into one's business valuation until you understand a little bit of what's going on, a little bit of the conditions and, and, and some of uh, the activity. But I'm going to maintain, as I always do, that this is all about planning, much like I'm sure Ronnie and Leslie, you coach people who are looking to start their business we try to encourage as much as possible, um, th think about what your ultimate end game is, what your goal is, and plan for that. If, if ultimately the reason you're opening a business is to have a, a successful exit, well, wh why not plan for that? And why not build the business directed towards that? So that's what I have to say, let's get going. All right, so who is Kensington? We have four main divisions. We are in mergers and acquisitions, meaning companies who want to sell and, and buyers who buy those companies. We have a division that Stu heads where we people looking to get into business can possibly uh, get into a franchise. So that's our franchise division. We represent about 180 national franchise brands. We also develop brands. You know, you have a, a, an idea, you're open in two, three, four locations, maybe you think your business is 
could expand uh, and become a franchise regionally or nationally. We help in that effort and we do business valuations. So one of the reasons I'm speaking today. All right. So in case this wasn't common knowledge, in, in any business life cycle, there's only four options. Ultimately, when you're done with that business, you, tr you can pass it on to the kids. The data suggests they're not interested. Um, so that's a real trend. You can structure it so that you can hand it down to the employees. There are a bunch of different structures in order to enable that. You can sell to an outsider. That's the majority of where we get involved. Or you can liquidate and, and, and shut the thing down. That's the option we don't want. Uh, and in fact, we, we have so much experience here, um, uh, also through the carnage of COVID, the, what people don't understand is it, it's not easy even to shut your business down and, and end it. You, know, you have lease obligations, you have debt, you have, you, you, you'll probably go into debt just to shut that business down. So we don't want that at all. All right, what's going on in the marketplace today? And, and I apologize if you really wanted to start with the valuation piece, but I think you, you, you need to have a sense of where we are and how we got here. So this is the question I get asked all of the time, and we have never been busier. The reality is while there, was, there were some sectors that got severely hurt in COVID, by and large, business didn't stop. By and large, activity, especially on Long Island, never ended, and we have never been busier. And I attribute that to the low cost of capital in the marketplace and the abundance of capital in the marketplace. So the government flooded us with money for to, to sustain those small businesses, and they flooded us with money to enable very, very low interest borrowing. So those weaker companies that had high debt really had the opportunity to clean up their balance sheets. And if, if anybody doesn't understand what I'm, what I'm referring to, I'm happy to circle back. But you know, balance sheets really show the health of the company. And if you're carrying heavy debt at high interest rates, we had a, a client who's, who used to finance their inventory using credit cards paying 19% interest on their credit card statements. It's unsustainable. So now the government swoops in, they have this, this PPP money, they borrow this money at a very low interest rate over 30 years, and wow, all of a sudden those balance sheets look so much healthier and, and, and the company in general is much healthier. So all of this is going on. COVID also really enabled people to reflect. I think it's, you know, you've heard about the, the challenge on employment um, these days. People don't want to work. People want to make it through a transition. You know, let's thank COVID. People had a chance to reflect. They hit the reset button. What do I want to do? I don't want to do this job anymore. So it's the same thing with business owners. If they were thinking of retirement, if they were thinking, you know, maybe in five years, I'll work five more years and then I'll spend time with my family. Well, you know what? They want to do it now. So, so they're looking for opportunities to either exit or to enter, to purchase. Um, and there is a spotlight as bright as can be on any business that was, look at my fingers, this much resilient through COVID. If you came out of COVID and you had a 20% uh, dip in your sales through 2020, and in, and you know you kind of recovered in 21. You're golden. There's nobody penalizing you for that poor performance. In fact, they they want you. They're going to give you higher valuations because you your business has proven to be resilient. And so we find the trend towards some of these, let's call them, you know, boring ish bread and butter type businesses. People are looking to get back to that. Okay, on the not so bright side, some, some sectors have been decimated. Food, hospitality, they're still reeling, they're still recovering. Thank goodness for, for the government support. Um, businesses suffer from lack of predictability. How do you know how much to order? We don't know if COVID is gonna come back, if Omicron is gonna take, if I'm gonna have to shut down. So that creates a lot of anxiety for sellers. I, I touched on employment issues, these are real. It's hard to find people, it's hard to keep people. And then I, I wrote this slide six months ago, uh, but look at what happened to costs, inflation. 
uh, the rising cost of everything uh, from cost of goods to employment to insurance. Everything is expensive for a business owner. <coughs> so it's not so easy. Um, and the pandemic has created fear. Business owners are afraid, um, again, which creates anxiety. Uh, and this is a very interesting time as we transition from a pandemic to a, an endemic, which is going to be with us for a long time. So that, but I can go into this for 45 minutes if anybody wants more detail, but I just wanted to paint the picture of what's going on in the marketplace. All right, so why am I telling you we need to plan? How will planning help my exit? And even though I'm, I'm talking in terms of exit, this is very important for people entering business. If you plan the ultimate goal, you first of all, you identify your goals. Very few people really do that. What do they want? Ultimately, what defines success for them in their business life? And maybe success is being able to run a business part-time so I could spend the rest of my time with my family. Maybe success is financial independence. Maybe success is somewhere in between. But what, what that is for that individual is exactly that. It's individual. There's no two definitions that are the same. But I contend, this is my argument, that if, you're, if you identify your goals and you're thinking about your exit, you will, by default, build a better business build a business that's more profitable, you'll have a better quality of life, and you will be more valuable on your exit. Because guess what? Those businesses with those attributes, that's what the buyers are looking for. And we'll talk about buyers and how they drive valuation. But remember, when a business sells, that's their finish line, potentially, but it's the buyer's starting line. So it's gotta look really good to the buyer. All right, and are you building a business that anyone would be interested in purchasing? Who wants to buy your business? So th these, are, these are my big kind of um, opening questions. So there are plenty of books on valuation and there are plenty of tools that are out there. And I like this particular one, which we use to help help break down the notion of valuation for a business owner in simpler terms. This, this is called the sellability score that you, you also see it branded as the value builder. And what they do is they've assembled data from now it's nearly 30,000 businesses who have sold and they've uh, refined that data through a series of valuation drivers uh, resulting in a score. And this score looks like a, you know, a gas gauge. Um, up, 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 up. Nope. Guess what, guys? I opened the wrong presentation. All right. So this score right here is determines, according to them, the valuation driver. So let me explain that. And then, you know, if, if I have a minute, I'll, I'll circle back and, and reopen the right one. Um, so businesses are sold on a multiple. When people talk about valuation, they talk about some multiple of a business's earnings or a business's revenue. More and more these days, what uh, buyers are looking for are the earnings. So if you have a business that's doing about a million dollars a year in revenue and earning about $100,000, you can expect that your business is gonna be worth some multiple of that $100,000. And whether it's worth two times, you know, whether it's worth 200,000, whether it's worth three or four or five times, that difference, has to do with how you're running your business and these value drivers that I, that I, that, um, I wanna talk about. And actually, it's probably good that I, that, I, that I opened the wrong slides because we can have more of a conversation rather than uh, just my showing you. But this tool tracks eight drivers of value. I wanna talk about the top three. The top three are revenue, the role of the owner, and concentration. Meaning what? Everybody can understand revenue, but how predictable that revenue is, is what moves the needle 
on the valuation. So a, an alarm company, everybody has monitoring service at, in their home for alarm systems. You pay that bill every month on a regular basis. Sometimes, you know, it's automatic withdrawal. You don't even feel it. Well, that's an example of very predictable revenue. We know how much money is going to come in tomorrow, next week, next month. Those companies are highly valued. They might get 10, 12, 15 times earnings because barring something terribly that goes wrong through something up, that, that revenue is going to be there. Other businesses that follow these models, you know, think about your membership in a gym. Think about your subscription to um, some, some new. Uh, there's a great story about the Harley Davidson company. Everybody knows Harley Davidson, the motorcycle company. They had a problem in that they were one of the top brand names. They had fantastic sales, but the market never really rewarded them. The, they, their stock was trading very low. And the reason is, if you buy a Harley Davidson motorcycle and spend ten thousand dollars, the markup was defined. You'll make, you know, the dealership makes two thousand dollars, the the company makes a thousand. You know, it wasn't low margin, but it was directly related to the sales. Sales dropped, earnings dropped, everything dropped. There was no recurring component, and they recognized that. So what did they do? There was a whole campaign whole brain trust they came that came up with the the harley club and you for a monthly fee i don't even know what the fee is can be part of the harley ecosystem the harley club find out where where the motorcycle runs are get newsletters uh content about how to optimize your performance how to store the motorcycle in the winter discounts on accessories I think the latest number was they have a, a nearly 5 million subscribers to their Harley Club. You know, even if you do simple math, $20 a month, boom, winning formula, recurring revenue, valuation. So when we meet business owners, we always try to get them to them. Some businesses, it's very, very difficult. You know, you think, think about a plumber or you think about, you know, how, how, how are you going to get... Uh, some level of recurring revenue, but that's a major driver in the valuation scale in terms of making the company worth more. Let me touch briefly on, on the other two. I, I, I mentioned it when I first opened. The role of the owner is hugely important. Again, same business, same revenue, same everything, one owner wears all the hats, does everything himself, holds all the cards, has all of the relationships with the vendors and the clients. That business is going to suffer on the valuation as compared to the same business with an ownership structure where the owner is not that important. He has management in place. A simple question that I ask um, uh, businesses from time to time is, can you take a, a month vacation? Can you take off for a month and your business not suffer? If the answer to that question is no, there's definitely room for improvement on how you run your business. And guess what, folks? Even though you may make a little less money right now because you're hiring an additional layer of management, you know, that mindset of, well, well, I could do it cheaper, I could do it better, and I'll save that money hurts you in the long run. So you, you want to try and break that mindset as much as possible. Do we have any accountants on the on the uh, on the call? We do. Yes. Yeah. Uh, my colleague Brenda Zhang is on the uh, call. Uh, is on the workshop in the workshop. She is an accountant in our office. So Brenda, I, with all due respect, and I, I don't mean this in 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 a negative way at all. <laughs> so there's no problem. So we all have you know, our opinions. So let me so. <laughs> I, I have conversations with sellers. Well, my accountant says that my business is worth 10 times earnings. Great. <laughs> Let's have your accountant go sell it. <laughs> so, so I can understand the focus on cash flow, 
-hmm. but um, just one of the many factors that goes into the valuation picture. I do agree. And also for different industries, you know, the case will be totally different. Correct. Absolutely. Uh, so, correct. you know, the situation is unique for each small business. Yes. Yeah. Without a doubt. Yeah. Um, a a any other questions um, before I keep going? Hey, Albert, could I add uh, one thing? Uh, uh, it it's kind of interesting that you mentioned inventory. And I know that uh, we had, uh, when I owned my company, we had a very good. Uh, earnings and cash flow, uh, but we had no cash because it was going into inventory. And it was like that company you mentioned, we had to continually add inventory to get to the next customer. So when it came to pay taxes, we had no cash. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. it was, uh, but to grow the business, it's actually, if you just stopped and stayed at your sales, you'd kind of catch up, but that's usually not the way it works. No. And this is where, you know, and this is where you got to love accountants, God bless them, because you get into the whole thing about cash accounting versus accrual accounting. The business on a cash accounting basis looks great. But then, but then you look at it in accrual and, uh, okay, how am I going to, how am I going to sustain this? Yeah, Albert, uh, I, I do have another comment. So for accounting, it's different from finance. So for accounting, we most of the time, we actually look for the historical data, look yep. for what already happened, and we summarize and consolidate. So that is a base, you know, for business valuation, but it really, it doesn't mean everything. So, um, yes, and, and, and as long as you brought that up, let, let, let's talk about that. So the, the, the historical financials and the, and the financials, they're like the engine, right? If you're going to purchase a car, there's, there's you know, what, what, what's under the hood? That's, everybody needs to know that. It's very important to understand that. It's very important to analyze that. And, you know, the kind of seating, the kind of tires, the style, those are the off-balance items. And, uh, and in, in, in looking at a business, we always start with the financials. But very often, and you know, I have this in these slides, when we talk about evaluation, um, the, we can have a business that doesn't have strong financials, but has other attributes. And how about their customers? You know, there could be a, a situation where they're in some certain accounts that are very difficult to get into. Maybe they have contracts with New York State. Um, and and so, so the... The other attributes, the off-balance sheet items, are very attractive to certain buyers, and that might drive valuation. Like even patents though, or even, something? Like if pardon? you have patents? Patents or? Oh, sure. Patents. Um, uh, you know, l l listen, um, you had internet companies that, had, uh, that were losing millions of dollars while they were trying to you know, uh, buy eyeballs that got these ridiculous valuations because of what they had. Their patent, their formula, their algorithm was eventually going to turn profitable. So people wanted it and wanted to invest in it. I agree. So uh, one very straightforward example is for small business will real estate uh, on their balance sheet. So on the balance sheet is always show up as a book value, which means, you know, the historical value when they purchase this real, real estate asset. However, you know, the market value is very, very different from the book value. Um, so that's why uh, the balance sheet really doesn't mean everything for business valuation. Agreed. Agreed. You got, but but you, you know you have to look at the balance sheet. You have to look at the P and L statements, right. and you have you have to understand again the future of the business, right? Yeah. Um, right? You know we we often also have sellers who you know they engage with a buyer, they take their foot off the gas. Um, I assume many of you understand the, the the process of purchase and sale. You 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 go into a due diligence phase. Uh, when you're going to purchase a business and that due diligence fa phase can, can be 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, uh, more sophisticated companies. Now uh, buyers are asking for quality of earnings reports. 
Anybody here know what a quality of earnings report uh, is? It, it's basically a, a forensic study of the quality of the revenue and the quality of, uh, of the, the clients. And, it, and it's very expensive um, and takes six months. So my point is that there are many things that happen along the way. And as a seller, if you, if you coast, if you take your foot off the gas, if you don't continue to run your company, when they turn around now, six months later to go look at the transaction and they see that sales are, are, are tanking and uh, people are leaving, employees are leaving, you may lose the deal. So, mm -hmm. you, so the rule to remember that it's the buyer's starting line, I think is very, very key to continue to operate the business the way you've been operating that business so that, uh, you know, so you give the buyer a really great platform to launch from. And that actually takes me to, to the next segment. But d does anybody else want to comment? I'm a business advisor. And when people Hi, um, are looking to sell their business, they're worried about the word getting out that the business is for sale. And I wonder how you factor in competitors that could come in and take over clients prior to the sale being finalized. Interesting. Um, yeah. Uh, so Willa, brilliant question. It, 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 it is the difference between selling someone's home and selling someone's business. Mm -hmm. You know, you put your house up for sale. We want everybody, they want everyone to know. You put your business up for sale. You don't want anyone to know. Okay. Confidentiality is the most important factor when we're looking at selling someone's business. So how do we do it? How, how in the world do we protect confidentiality? And it's not just confidentiality because you could lose your clients, you could lose your staff, you could lose your vendors. So you can't have a, a seller be hurt by the sales process. Uh -huh. So at Kensington and Stu, um, feel free to jump in anytime if you want to make a comment. So we are skilled at advertising without saying anything. So let's say that trucking company, right? The, the Glamis' client is, is for sale. If we use the word trucking, you know, truck moving company available, we, we you know, let's say they're based in Merrick, New York, we're gonna say tri-state area. We cannot have anybody from the public announcement figure out what the business is. Um, so we, we do some high level um, uh, profile, 30 year business, uh, owner will teach and train, doing a million dollars in revenue, earning $200,000, uh, growth potential with schools and, uh, and corporate and, 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 we will, and we'll, we'll build the public persona for that business with a listing number. If a client is interested, they come through our, our funnel we, me, Stuart, my, my associates at Kensington, we qualify them. They have to sign a confidentiality agreement. And only then might we disclose the information on that business. And then let me tell you why I put it in, in those words. You live in California. You're not moving to New York. You're looking for an absentee business and you inquire about this trucking company, which is a New York-based hands-on business that needs to run. There's no match. You're not buying this business. You're not getting the information. There's, even if you sign a confidentiality agreement, I'll tell you a little about it so you don't feel like you wasted your time, but there's no reason for me to give you the information. There's no way you're ever gonna buy it. I'll give you another scenario. You love the business, you're in New York, you could be a perfect operator, but you have no money. I can't release this information. You, you're not a qualified buyer. You cannot, you won't get credit. You can't buy, you have no money for a down payment. What are we talking about? So that's the level of security that everyone at Kensington is trained on because the, the other piece that's, that's really, really, um, you know, the, the question is ultimately, Willa, why a professional group like us? 
right? Because that ultimately is what it is. Because we are, we're the linebackers or really the offensive line. We're protecting that business from not getting hurt by the process. And um, so, so just think about a good buyer, signs an NDA, very interested, uh, wants to move forward and now says, great, I love everything I see. When can I meet the team? I want to talk to the team. I want to see what I'm buying. Red flag, right? And managing that and figuring out when and how we can expose the team, the clients, the vendors, like the really sensitive information that, you know, is, is requires a, a, a real skill. So I just wanted to mention that because Stu was talking about employees. And Albert, we love educating through real life examples. Right now has a very large meat distribution company. I, I'm in a challenging situation with one of my buyers. He bought a small neighborhood butcher store for me two years ago, struggled to put the dollars together, finds Albert's multi-million dollar meat distribution business. The guy signed an NDA and wants info, and I'm not giving it to him. I, I'm like, listen, no disrespect. It, like you're a phenomenal buyer. I appreciate working with you. I help sell you a business. But we bought a business for 400 grand. You're talking about buying a business for $4 million. I don't want to be rude, but till I understand where this money is coming from, where the rest of your team is, I don't care that you signed the NDA. I don't care that we have a relationship. My obligation, Kensington's obligation, we, we protect that seller. I'm not giving out your information unnecessarily. A, a, and do we potentially ever err on the side of protecting ourselves out of a deal? Probably very rarely. We, we don't want to do that. But but we got to protect that seller first and foremost. It, 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 it's... That's our obligation, and and and, that, and that's how you get these sellers comfortable with the process. You know, they gotta feel, they gotta feel like they're protected. Yeah, I just want to mention that we're not. We only have another half hour or less than uh, that. Just about a half hour left, and I know you're available to, for people to email you. I mean, at least Stuart has always said, please. He loves educating people, so I'm sure people can get in touch with you after if they have additional questions but you may have some slides that you really do want to get to. So maybe we should try to address that, those now. What do you think? Um, sure. Okay. Just, you know, just saying. Yeah. Um, but, I, you know, listen, I, I'm, I'm happy to do that, but I love this interaction. Thank you, yes, guys. Yes, yes, you, yes. You, the questions are well, great. I'm yeah. curious, what do you do if you have both the seller and the buyer approach you, not knowing that, you know, each one doesn't know that you're that you're representing the other person. Obviously, you can't represent both the seller and the buyer. Um, correct. And um, so, when we when we're selling someone's business, we're representing the seller. Mm -hmm. All right. We may have tons of relationships with buyers. I have buyers call me all the time. Hey, Albert, you have anything for me? You know, great. I'll keep him top of mind. Uh, but you can't you can't represent you know both in in the same thing. Now that being said, we do have what we what, what's known as um, uh, buyers engagements, where um, we get hired by a company. I, I, I just I just did this um, in the pest industry. Uh, company A wants to grow, uh, so we reach out. We we do letters, we do mail, we do email campaigns to to see if we can identify and find uh, somebody for them to acquire. So we, we can represent sellers, we can represent buyers, but Ronnie, we can't do both. Of course. Uh, you know. Okay, so jumping back in, what, what's missing here in, in all candor just was the, the descriptive uh, slides about you know, the eight attributes on that particular tool. You know, I talked about recurring revenue. I talked about the role of the owner. Uh, you know, I wanted to mention concentration. Concentration is huge. If your business is concentrated in one client or one vendor or one employee that could tank your company, your valuation goes down. It's just math, right? So you, you want to try to reduce that concentration. We, I don't have this case study in, in this particular presentation, but we have an example of a, a company, it was a commercial cleaning company uh, that did work for Federated. 
and Federated um, owned Macy's and owned a couple of other things. Well, and they, they yeah, correct. And what, what ultimately, when they came to sell it, we when we looked at the the revenue, it really it was ninety percent was concentrated in Federated. We said we can't sell you. We, this, the market is not going to pay you, any, and and they were making money, but because they were so concentrated in one client, they were unsellable. So the answer to that situation was we went and we did a search and we acquired another company that serviced a lot of clients, and we brought that 80%, 90% customer concentration down to 50 60%. Now they were sellable, and they got a, a very good multiple, and that was a success story. So, And this is what I mean when I talk about right here in this slide, the attributes of the business. Does the business have the attributes that a buyer is looking for? And concentration is a, is a very uh, important one. So I like to focus on when I'm talking about um, valuation, who is looking at your company? So business owners, rightfully so, don't spend the time understanding who the buyers are. We very often have companies who come to us and um, they feel like their business is not sellable. And when we when we drill down a little further, why are you not sellable? Well, nobody's going to buy it. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm you know I'm I'm in plumbing. I don't know why I'm picking on plumbing. I'm in plumbing, and you know I don't have this. Uh, so, I you know right? Did did you know that uh, there's private equity groups doing roll ups of plumbing companies? Did you know? So there's so much going on in the world of mergers and acquisitions that sellers don't know about. So the ones here on the left might be. Uh, the people that, you know, they could identify, but they very rarely have knowledge about these guys here. Family offices. These are, com these are families who are wealthy and have money, and maybe it's one, two, three families, and they hire a couple of MBAs and give them a bunch of money and say, go grow my portfolio. I want return on investment, and I don't like the stock market. So they buy companies. Maybe they, there's something called a search fund where the family puts money together just to buy a company for little Johnny so that Johnny can have a business to run. Don't ask me why I called him little Johnny. Uh, um, and then private in investment groups. You know, you've all heard of uh, private equity firms. You know, they, they do roll-ups all of the time. They do add-ons to their portfolio companies. It's a very, very rich resource of where to look for buyers. Uh, and then you have the synergistic companies, the private companies. You have public companies doing roll-ups. And I, I want to touch on this one. It has been over the last 10 years, so I'm not being political. It's become increasingly difficult to make your way to the United States on a, on a, on a permanent visa or a temporary visa. Uh, for citizenship, it, the, just the rules has become complicated. So one of the last ways that are out there for foreign buyers to make their way to the U.S. is through business ownership. So there are a couple of programs, uh, E2 and uh, EB5, depends on different amount of investment. But if you can prove that you're investing a certain amount of money and you came into that money legally, you can secure you can secure citizenship, visas that lead to citizenship for, you know, you and up to 15 family members or 15 associates. So there's real interest, even in a business where a, a, a seller thinks he has no value. So that's why you need to speak to your professionals. Um, you know, again, you, the sellers do not know why the buyer is buying uh, again, are they looking to buy the cash flow? They're just looking to recreate a job. Uh, there's many, many reasons buyers are buying, and and sellers don't focus on this. We do. Um, just these are these are you know again just more reasons people buy companies. But you know one thing that's common: every buyer thinks they can improve the business, and that's key. That's very important. Um, I I don't believe we have the time to go through all of these, but I I do I did put in here. Um, you know, a couple of case studies. Uh, and I just want to go to the right one, which I think you might find interesting. Whoops, that's not what I want. Okay. This is a great one to study because this talks about um, 
specifically what, what, what I touched on earlier. We had the listing, this is an importer of luxury items. And um, in some time, somewhere in 2019, uh, we, we had a potential sale. Um, we went into contract. The, the deal price was, uh, I lost my mouse here, was here, was $750,000, including the inventory. I think the inventory was about $150,000. And this is in February or March, right before COVID hit. So now COVID hits in March of 2020. And his business drops by 80%, 80%. So after trying to keep this thing alive for six months, eight months, the deal falls apart. What buyer can go purchase a company when the, the business has changed so drastically? So things look dire for this seller, except he pivoted. The seller pivoted and then got money from the government. So the, this seller's pivot on the luxury, the, he used to sell these luxury items to retailers. Um, and then you know retail stores were closed, which is why the sales dropped so, so much, there's nothing to buy. So he made a pivot to online. So people started shopping online, sales started to increase, but more importantly, he got to sell at retail, not wholesale, so he's making more money. So he started to focus on, on B2C, business to consumer instead of B2B. So the sales come back with higher margins. And then this is the, the, the magic of uh, the PPP. He was able to take some really expensive debt. You could see how much he was paying in debt over here. And uh, you know this, this one, the credit card one really gets me. Um, and he was able to reduce his overall debt by 125,000. He was able to re replace all of the um, expensive debt. Um, and we sold his company in late 2020 at a million dollars, at a higher valuation, not even a year later, because he was able to clean up his balance sheet. Um, and there's another part to the story. Uh, I don't know if it's in here or not. All right. Um, the other part to the story is that if he sold here in 2020 at $750,000, after paying off his debt and after paying off his vendors and after paying the taxes, he really would have been left with nothing. When he made this sale at a million dollars, because he restructured the entire thing, he's keeping like $400,000 from this sale. It was a huge win for this guy. Okay, I'm not gonna talk about this te telecom agency, but it was another COVID success story. I wanna talk about this one. This one is, this is the one I talk about, which business owners should be acutely aware of. I have a 75 year old seller in questionable health. He's a, an amazing person built the company from scratch. He's a mechanical engineer. He engineered some products that do really, really good things in the marketplace for children who are impaired, um, learning disabilities, autism, things like that. And he wears most of the hats in the business. When in, in learning about this company, when I was speaking with him, he told me he had an offer of $3 million five years ago, and he turned it down. Since that time, the business has been declining, mainly because of his health issues. And we market the company at $1.5 million, all right? Five years ago, he had a $3 million offer and we're going into the market at 1.5 million. In February of 2020, I bring him an offer of a million dollars. He turns it down, thinks the company is worth more. Then COVID affects his business because he, a lot of his sales were to schools and schools were shut down. Two months ago, he was diagnosed with kidney failure and he can't operate the company any longer, has to shut it down. There are no options, zero options. He waited too long. You don't want this to happen, but we see this all too often. And you could see the pattern. Mm -hmm. All right. so. 
That's unfortunate. It's so unfortunate. So what's my message today, ladies and gentlemen? As a business owner, identify your goals. What do you want out of this business? And then map out a strategy to get there. How are you going to get there? Assemble an all-star team of professionals to help you. You can't do it alone. You need that CPA. You need the good business attorney. You may need guys like us. You need financial advisors. Put them together. Let them do what they do for you. Don't be a maverick. Give yourself enough time. When you're selling a company, like the example I gave you before, that poor gentleman just ran out of time. There's an inverse relationship between time and price. If you have more time, you could maybe get more. Maybe, yeah. Um, If you have less time, you're under pressure. You're going to take whatever you get. Uh, Don't assume your business has no value. Don't assume your business has tremendous value. Um, So I'm not going to talk about uh, some of what colors my... uh, thinking on this. This is a story of one of my businesses from years back. And uh, uh, Bob, was I I talking to you about inventory? I love this one. I can talk to you about an hour about this one, the relationship between uh, expenses and inventory. So, um, and then I have some mistakes that sellers make. But I I believe, again, given the time, uh, this might be a good moment to pause again and see if we have any questions. Yeah, no, uh, you know, very interesting uh, factor when uh, we ended up uh, selling our business was the importance of uh, margin. Like we were, you know, if our parts cost 50 cents, we sold them for a dollar, about 50%. You know, a venture capitalist that uh, kind of mentored me in the whole process of, you know, a couple buys and sells said, the higher the margin, the more that's going to process into your valuation. He ended up with a company, I think, that had 80% margin. And that's where he spent the rest of his career. He just said, it's like, it's a cash machine. It's, 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 it's the one, another one of those golden rules. Yes, I agree with everything you're saying. I mean, anything that you're seeing out there, I, get, I know it varies by industry, you know, uh, margin, things like that. Uh, you know, distributors tend to be lower. Yeah, you know, yeah. some, like software and pharmaceuticals tend to be very high. I, yeah. You kind of scale he, everything you do to that. So, so the, the meat distributor that Stuart was mentioning, notoriously low margins, five, five to 6% is the industry average. The software company is the other side of that coin, very high margins. So I, I fully agree with you. Uh, margins are very, very important. Uh, margins are getting squeezed because costs are going up. So it's, it's a challenge right now. Uh, to 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 keep healthy margins, you know it's you have competitors, right? You can't overprice your product. Your competitor is going to lower you. You have the competition from overseas, right? China. Uh, so focusing on margin is that's where business owners really have to think. But the only kind of thinking I would, um, you know, maybe introduce is that Harley Davidson example, right? Where they couldn't increase margin and you, you, know, you can't maintain it. And you, so what do you do? So you have to figure out you know, something to enable maybe a service component. Look, Best Buy has the geek squad. Why? Because they're so concerned about uh, you know, our purchases from, from their company. No, they need something that gives them margin. They need something that gives them stickiness. So. You, so you've got to come up as a business owner with a way to keep those margins healthy. And if you can't do it in the product, you have to figure out how to do it um, surrounding the product. Absolutely agree. So I just wanted to comment. I'm working to pick up a listing right now that I don't think I want to pick up the listing. It's this landscape maintenance company. All they do is work for New York City that they get through bid work. The guy is doing two and a half million in revenue. Financials are immaculate. He's earning $150,000. He's got 30 employees. He's got 17 trucks. I'm like, listen, no disrespect. Congratulations on the company that that you built and and the the fleet and everything. But you're making $150,000 and have 30 plus employees. Like this is a beast of an operation and you're not 
getting paid for running a beast of an operation. Like, I'm not going to have buyers that, that, that want this necessarily at any price. Forget the multiple that he wants and what, what he thinks the company is worth. I, I'm like, even at a three times multiple, two times, but nobody wants to take on this burden of responsibility for, for this money. Your, your margins are wrong. You're winning too many bids on with, with you're bidding too low. I, I don't know what to tell you, but it, it's not sellable. And I don't say it's not sellable, maybe a competitor that doesn't need the equipment that had just wants, the, you know, but at the dollars, we're talking about getting creative and looking for a needle in a haystack on a two. I should be jumping for joy. The phone rings again. Devil is in the details. Hey, I have a, a, a landscape maintenance company where every dollar is on the books. And I'm doing two and a half million in revenue. I can't drive down there quick enough to get it. But devil is in the details. You start understanding more. How much labor do you have? How much equipment do you have? How much are you making? Wow. Okay. So again, margin is incredibly important. So, so it's just, Stu, I'm going to pick up on that. The slide I glossed over with the inventory on my, my previous business, you want to talk about a low margin industry. I was in um, computers and consumer electronics. It's where I cut my teeth very early on. Um, and uh, I, I build myself as the, the nobody beats the whiz of New England. So if anybody remembers, nobody beats the whiz. Yes. And, that, and that's what I did. And, and I, like Stu said, I built a monster. I built a monster. I was I was focused on growth, and you know I had I was doing two million in sales after my second year, and I said let's let's get it up there, and you know and I grew it to five million in sales within three years, and the reason it was a monster, and the reason you know the devil is in the details, is that nobody could run that business other than me. It was impossible. Now I'm not patting myself on the back. I, I left all money on the table. I, could, I couldn't get rid of it. I couldn't sell it. You know, I, I finally just gave it to the employees because I, I, I had to leave New England. The, the story is that uh, I was in Southern Maine and uh, we used to drive to Boston just to look at the lights. You know, I'm a New, I'm a New York kid. There was nothing for us to do there. So, wow. so um, yeah. you know, so it really is about the detail. You know, at first blush, $5 million in sales looks great. But what, what I had to do to sustain that level of sales, you know, yeah. juggling uh, paying this vendor versus that vendor and, you know, and uh, increasing the inventory um, it was very, very painful. So, um, so I don't know if we answered any question, but I felt and I'll that- I'll just was say the problem with like one size fits all. So Kensington Company, we work on great margin. We're a service business. We sell businesses. But one day the owner wants to sell the company. You're going to hate the customers. They already bought last year. You got to wake up every morning feeling unemployed and go meet new people. And so, yeah, we had that great margin in the business, but the customer. So it, it's there are all these different levels. So you're now in the margin, but you, you, you're missing the, 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 the next level. And it, it's a whole collaboration. And at the end of the day, sellers and their motivation. Stu, I want to get out of here tomorrow and get to California. I'm a new grandma. That's where my grandkids are. Uh, uh, let's go pricing and get you over there. Stu, I got nothing to look forward to. I want to sell my business, but I want every last penny. Oh, awesome. We'll take that listing. Too. We need time. We're not going it, to... It, it's there are just ranges of just emotions at the same time. Forget everything that's logical. There are just some listings I want. That the, the, there's this intangible specialness about the business that we could feel. And, and sometimes logic goes out the door and uh, we, we've been successful there also. So I tell everyone, I left the crystal ball at home, but what buyers want, they want to reduce anxiety. It, the, the, the more they could understand the business, the more stable. Again, as Albert's pointing out, you, one year you're doing 2 million, next year a million and a half, next year 3 million, next year 2 million. Hard to buy that company. I, I, I really don't know how to predict it. We, we've sold a lot of Surpro businesses. You, you get big storms and, and, and numbers are fantastic. Next year, it, it's a mild winter. You, you know, numbers could jump. It, it's hard to go sell it on just last year's numbers. They're going to want to take an average of the last few years. The, the, the next industry doesn't really work that way. They, they, they're really focused. What, what did you do last year? I don't care about five years ago, Stu. It, it, you know, that's ancient history. So, 
industry to industry, seller to seller, buyer to buyer, they're, they're just personalities, how we structure things, how the personality of an owner. I go into some businesses, I say, you're the biggest challenge. You're, you're like perfect. You walk on water, everything's immaculate. I haven't asked you a question that you haven't given me an answer to the 12th decimal point. You, 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 you know, I'm going to buy your business. I'm expecting that I'm not going to do as well as you. You, you, you are just so high performing it, 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 and that could hurt a sale. I don't want to buy a business unless I could find ways I'm going to be able to go grow it. Wow. This owner doesn't believe in social media and, and stinks at marketing. Well, now I'm excited. I got things maybe I could go do better, but, but if everything is perfect, I, I'm also running for it. I say that. And then the next buyer calls, don't you have a perfect business that's just set up right that, 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 that I could just try and maintain versus, you, you, you know, so it's even what I want and the next buyer are, are, it makes no difference. So we work with individuals, as Albert said, every scenario just requires us understanding it and motives and emotions. And if we're sick and we got to sell, well, I don't care about your balance sheet. Let's go price this and go get you the hell out of here. It, 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 it's, hey, I got all the time in the world. Awesome. Let, let, let's go strategically look for that right buyer that, that's going to pay you the, the, the top dollar. So, yeah, and and and, and at, Stu, that's a great segue because you know, again, I'm looking at the time just to basically it, it 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 reinforces what we said at the beginning. There's no two situations that are identical. That's why you need your professionals, and um, you know we we every day is different. Every situation is different. Every seller is different. Every valuation is different. Um, and, uh, you know, anything we can do to help um, SBDC or any of your clients, we're, we're more than happy to do that. I just want to say, you know, from everything that you've said, you know, in the end, how much is your business, how much is your business worth? Well, it depends. Yes. 